it's now time to begin our first lesson. What is JSTL? As I mentioned just a moment ago, the first lesson focuses on the background motivations for using JSTL. In order for us to understand the purpose and motivation for JSTL, we really need to understand good, good design practices when it comes to Java applications and, and more specifically Java web applications. When we go to build a Java application or a web application that uses Java, there are three primary best practices that the industry has adopted. The first one is the idea of separation of concern. Separation of concern generally means that each modular, each module in my application is standalone. This allows me to have reusability. It allows me to have uh, loose couplings within my system, but more importantly, it allows me to have a module that does a very specific thing. Common examples of a uh, modular-based system would be a system that contains a module, a module for validation, or a module for persistence, or a module for logging. The Java platform is built with the separation of concern in mind, and most Java developers are using separation of concern without really knowing it. The second best practice is the idea of abstraction. This is nothing new to web application design, nor is it new to Java design. It is a general object-oriented goal. The purpose behind abstraction is that it allows us to have reusability across different applications from a single component. In order for us to create abstraction, we have to design our system with loose couplings in mind. We have to focus on creating um, components or concerns that have a high level of cohesion. They're self-contained. And last but not least, we need to encapsulate low-level low level details such as exceptions and abstract them and hide them from higher-level code. The third design goal or the third best practice is reuse. In the world of object-oriented programming as well as web design, the intent is for me to create one piece of code that can be reused across multiple systems. General web application development does not lend itself to those best practices. It's very hard and very messy for somebody to design a system around those best practices on their own. So usually when people go to create a web application solution, they adopt some form of a model view controller paradigm to support the best practice goals. The model view com controller paradigm implicitly creates a separation of concern. By breaking up the application into three pieces, the model, the view, and the controller, the developer can focus on each individual piece to make the entire application function. The model represents a business object. In the Java world, that's usually a Java bean or a plain old Java object, also known as a POJO. The view typically represents the presentation logic for the model. In the world of Java web development, that's usually found in a JSP. A JSP accesses a properties or, or values within the Java bean and translates them into some human readable UI representation. And then the controller, its purpose in life is to function as a traffic cop, making sure that the model and the view can speak to one another and that data is passed from the model to the view and the view to the model. Uh, controllers are typically implemented using a servlet structure, but could also be implemented using something that's known as a filter. In order for me to create a model in a Java web application, I would use, most commonly, a Java bean. There are some advantages for me uh, from a design perspective to use a Java bean over a POJO. However, this class is not, uh, this lesson is not intended to go through the differences between those two technologies. So let's just look at the Java Beans. Java Beans is a specification-driven component model. It is defined as part of the Java community process by Sun. Uh, from a user interface perspective, Java Beans as a specification was created to define reusable UI components, such as buttons, uh, text boxes, windows, things like that. Over time, the specification model, or the specification for Java Beans has driven, it has derived into a 
coding standard. So from our perspective, when we do web application design, we'll look at Java Beans with three things in mind. We'll look at the coding convention around construction. Java Beans tells us that we need to have a public class it also tells us that we need to have a public no argument constructor. And for those of you who are very experienced with Java, you'll remember that the compiler will add a constructor on our behalf if we forget one. The Java Beans model says that you must explicitly provide a public no argument constructor. The second thing that we'll, we'll take into account when we build our Java objects is the idea of properties. The Java Bean specification defines properties in two ways. There are standard value-based properties and there are index-based properties. In this lesson and its sub-lessons, we are only looking at value-based properties. Index properties are usually used to refer to things like arrays or elements in a list. Properties in, in the Java Bean Convention are defined in pairs. Accessor, accessors, meaning I'm going to read the value are defined using a get or an is. Is is obviously reserved for Booleans. Mutators, meaning I'm going to manipulate the value of a property, is defined using a set. Following the theme of construction, the properties must also be public methods. And then the last piece that we're going to adopt in our Java Bean implementation is persistence. Persistence within the virtual machine can be very complex or it can be very simple. We're going to adopt the simplistic approach and make our Java beans serializable. Before you now, you see an example of a Java bean. This Java bean is found in the source code file propertiesbean.java. You can open that up in your IDE at the moment. Once you open up propertiesbean.java, what I would like you to do is review the structure of the class. You'll notice in propertiesbean.java, I have a public class. The second thing that you'll notice from a construction perspective is that I have a public constructor. Both of those adhere to the construction rules of the Java. <laughs> from there, you can see that I have properties defined using get and set methods. It turns out that this Java Bean is just an implementation of a read-only Java Bean. There is no way for me to physically manipulate the values of the properties. The last piece is that the Java Bean does adhere to that serialization process. So it implements the serializable interface, which you'll notice belongs to the Java.io package. From a development perspective, I could now take this Java Bean, compile it, and have it exist within my web applications web imp classes directory. Doing this is a well-formed model that I could use within my JSP application. Now that we've examined the requirements of a model, let's look at a view. When I go to build a view within a Java web application, the most typical technology that I use is a JSP. There are some design goals when developing a JSP. The first design goal is to have it the least amount of Java logic as possible within the JSP. That means that my JSP's primary focus is on rendering HTML. The second design goal is to have reuse. Whenever I create a large scale web application, it will be more efficient if I can reuse multiple if I can reuse a single screen multiple times throughout my application. The secondary design goal really lends itself to the idea of creating cohesion within my JSP. 